after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went out to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went with her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Once again, it's great to be able to share God's word with you. Uh, But before I share God's word with you, I too have an announcement. Um, not as exciting and good news as uh, Chris's announcement to us as a church family, but a number of you will know the, the Messer family, uh, Steve and Jenny, Sally and the rest of the family. Uh, we got news this week that uh, Sally has passed away and that she has gone to be with her saviour. I just want to share uh, a note that I came across that Steve had posted uh, on social media, and so I'd just like to read a couple of excerpts of that. Uh, Steve says, uh, Dear friends, It is with heavy hearts that we pass on the news that our darling Sally Jennifer Messer left us to be with the Lord Jesus. We have much for which we are grateful to God. He has sustained us through many difficult days. Sal was his gift to us, and being her family was a joyful privilege. We have been witness to many miracles, not the least of these of which that throughout these testing years, Sal never complained of. We are grateful to all who have prayed and helped us in practical ways. To those who contributed to the home renovation project, which enabled us to care for Sal at home for longer than the two years and three months she was away in hospital in Melbourne. We are deeply thankful for the doctors, nurses, and ambulance crews who became part of our lives, and for each member of our round-the-clock team who enabled Sal to be home in Druin, surrounded by love. Steve Hughes uses the words of Romans 12, 12, where he says, Sal remained to the end, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. We are comforted by God's words from heaven in Revelation 14, 13. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Is our love and gratitude to the Messer family. I'll pray in a moment for, uh, for the Messer family on your behalf. 
Uh, but uh, Sally's funeral will be uh, this Friday at uh, 2 o'clock here at the church. Uh, if you're able to uh, assist with that, your help would be greatly appreciated. Um, Anne is uh, coordinating all the catering. So even if you can't attend on the day, I'm sure Anne would love for you to pass on uh, some cooking, baking, whatever you can contribute in that way. Uh, but if you can help on the day, that would be greatly appreciated as well. So uh, before we turn to God's word, uh, let's again lift up our hearts in prayer and lift the message up before us. Father, in all circumstances of life, we thank you that you are our God. This morning, Father, we have rejoiced by praising your name in song, by rejoicing of the news that you are leading us towards a new pastor. Father, we know that in the realities of life, in this sin-fallen world, there are also times of sadness and of mourning. And this morning, Father, we do want to lift up before you the Messer family, and particularly Steve and Jenny, Sally's siblings. Father, please surround them with your comfort, with your peace, with your love. May you continue to be gracious to them. Father, we thank you that even though they are mourning at this time, that their hope is firmly found in you. And Father, in the days that are ahead, as they make adjustments, as they have the funeral this coming Friday, Father, we pray that you would be their solid anchor throughout this time, that you would be strengthening them in their faith, that even though they would be sad as they journey through this time, Father, we thank you that you are continuing to lead them towards a heavenly home. Father, we do give you thanks for Sally's life. We thank you for her testimony, for her witness through trials that she experienced that none of us can imagine. So, Father, we do thank you for her life and for the witness that she has made. Father, we do pray for one another because we all have different recollections and uh, memories with the Messer family. But Father, we also may be hurting in different ways. So Father, please draw near to each one of us as you are drawing near to the Messer family. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would uh, take your Bibles and turn back to the passage that uh, Michelle read to us this morning. We're going to be looking at, uh, as a follow-on to last week to uh, Mark's Gospel. And this morning I want the, you to think about, as I challenged you last week, is to think about your response to Jesus. We all respond in different ways to different items of news. We've seen the reactions this morning. And maybe this morning you're troubled by the news that I've just given you about Sally's passing. But maybe you're thinking also at the same time, well, I'm rejoicing in the news that Chris has given us because potentially, depending on you, we get a new pastor. But we all respond differently, don't we? Uh, for us in our lives, and uh, I like to play golf along with my sons, but Danielle thinks that golf is a walk that is spoiled. And, and so she doesn't, not that keen on golf. Uh, the same when it comes to air shows. I get all excited when there's air shows, standing there watching planes zoom around the skies. Danielle just goes, no, nah, that's not for me. But we respond to those events in different ways, don't we? And, and particularly when you have events in your life that are events of great news and great joy, uh, what do you feel with inside yourself? Yes, you've got that excitement, but you want to go and tell, don't you? Or at least I hope you do. I trust that that is the case when we have good news, whether it be about engagements or upcoming births or, or celebrations that were within family. But even as we know within our lives that the reactions do differ as we look at different events, and particularly this morning as we look at Jesus starting his ministry, we see people responding in different ways. And so as we look at their responses, I want you this morning to think about your response to Jesus and how you will continue to follow him in the days that are ahead. Well, in verse 14, we read there that John was put in prison at a certain point in time. And it was at this time that now Jesus comes onto the scene and commences his ministry. As we looked at uh, last week, in verses 14 and 15, Jesus uh, clearly says that the time has come the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. We've done repenting this morning, haven't we, as we've met around the Lord's table. We've once again been reminded of what our Saviour has done for us by Him dying on the cross, Him forgiving our sins and bringing us into that right relationship with God. And I trust that each one of you this morning 
can say that you have repented and believed. But as we move forward in our passage this morning, look as we go into verse 16, we see about Jesus' ministry, and there's uh, four things I want you to see about Jesus' ministry firstly before we look at the responses. As we see Jesus moving about Galilee and Capernaum, we see that Jesus' ministry is firstly, it's a personal ministry. Is that he gets alongside people. He, he comes to the disciples, to Simon and his brother Andrew. He comes to James and to John and he actually commands them. He calls them to follow him. He is interested in individual lives. We see there later in our passage that after the synagogue down a, a little bit further in verse 29 and 30 is that he enters into the home of Simon and sees there that Simon's mother-in-law is ill. What does Jesus do? He has compassion. He is personal. He is relational with her. And he goes to her and heals her. And we see that often throughout Jesus' ministry. That there he is. He is interacting with people. Yes, he has the public proclamation and that he is doing that. And we'll look at that in a moment. But he gets alongside people with grace, with compassion, with love. Occasionally words of uh, correction and rebuke. But Jesus' ministry is a personal ministry. If you go down to verse 35, we see another aspect of Jesus' personal ministry. What does he do? He withdraws from the public eye. He goes away to a very quiet place and he spends time communicating with his Father. And even though Jesus is God, he is the Son of God, he still takes that time to foster, as it were, his personal relationship with his Heavenly Father. Jesus' ministry is a personal ministry. But we also see, secondly, that Jesus' ministry is a public ministry. And notice in verse 21 that when they went to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath day, Jesus went into the synagogue where he began to teach. The synagogue was where people, where the Jews gathered to hear the reading of God's word and to hear it explained, where they came together to offer prayers. They occasionally went into the temple, but here in the synagogue setting, it was equivalent, if you like, to what we do on a Sunday where we come together to remind each other, to encourage each other in the grace and the mercy of our God. We also see the public ministry being demonstrated that as Jesus moves about, crowds are coming to him, particularly as they understand that Jesus is this man who is powerful, who brings about healing. The crowds come to him, the people are bringing their sick to him, and he is crowded so much to the point where he says, let's leave this region and let's go somewhere else. Jesus indeed has a very public ministry. They come to him and they are healed. The sick, the demon-possessed, all come to Jesus and Jesus heals them in a very public demonstration of his authority. The third thing I want you to see about Jesus' ministry is that it is a purposeful ministry. Notice, as he said in verse 14, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe can't have a much clearer message, can you? That this is what Jesus came to do. He came to declare that the kingdom of God is at hand. We see that Jesus, in a very significant way, conducts his ministry. It's not simply what he does for himself, but what he does for us. He brings us again back to the Father. He is the one through whom we come to Jesus, uh, sorry, to God the Father through Him. Jesus has a definite purposeful ministry. Notice there that in verse 38 and 39 uh, that the disciples come to Him. Sorry, in verse 36, where Simon and his companions went to look for Him. And when they found Him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you, Jesus. Look at how the ministry is being established here. Look at how the crowds are coming to you. Jesus, you need to go and to serve them. But what does Jesus do? No, again, reminded of his mission, reminded of the purpose of which he came, he replies in verse 38, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Yes, Jesus is interested in healing people and restoring what sin has affected. But can you see here that Jesus has a, a greater purpose it is not just to please the whims of the crowd, but to come with the very uh, specific purpose of preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. 
It is near and it is there with Jesus. That is why I have come. With Jesus' ministry being personal and being public, with the call also going to you and I, we too carry on Jesus' ministry. Whether it be in our work life, whether it be in our representation of Christ within our sporting community, whether it be representing Christ within our families and being that witness to Him, we too have a ministry. But we can get caught up in the busyness and in the needs of other people. We can just get caught up in all of the activity. And I wonder whether sometimes too, in fact, whether each and every week we too need to be like Jesus, where we withdraw to that quiet place, where we rest, where we commune with God the Father, where we again remind ourselves as to why God has placed us in certain situations, because we too need to be purposeful as we follow Jesus. Now, I'm not very much a morning person. So when it reads, very early in the morning when it was still dark, Jesus went, that, that's not me. So in my schedule, I need to find those times where I can sit and where I can reflect and where I can again be reminded of the goodness of God. Because I don't know about you, I need that encouragement of being in God's Word and, and, and praying and thinking and reflecting on those things. I need to be a part of a small group of people where they too can have input into my lives and to encourage me and spur me on because at times life is difficult, isn't it? I need to be part of a wider church family. And I gain that encouragement by coming each and every Sunday by mixing amongst you. I mightn't speak to each and every one of you each and every week, but it is encouraging to gather as a bigger group of people so that we can be reminded again of the ministry that God has called us to and the purpose that he has within our lives. So Jesus' ministry, it is personal, it is public, it is purposeful. But I also want you to see that it is a powerful ministry. Notice that as Jesus moves around in different settings, we see that displayed in different ways. He goes into the synagogue and he begins to teach and the people are amazed. Why are they amazed? Because he preaches with authority. There is authority in the teaching that Jesus brings. We will see shortly in the encounter with the demon-possessed man that Jesus is the one who has authority over that demon and casts that demon out of the man. And we also read that Jesus has that authority over sickness. Simon's mother-in-law, Jesus goes to her. She is healed. And this shows us and gives us a glimpse as to what Jesus came to do. And that was to restore those whom he healed back to what they were meant to be. When God created the world, he created everything good, and in fact it was very good, it was perfect. There was no sickness, there was no death, there was no struggle. There was that perfect and that harmonious relationship with God. But then sin enters into the world. And ever since that time, we have had to battle, we have had to wrestle with sin, whether it be in our own individual lives, whether it be the frailty of our bodies, whether it be sickness coming upon us, whether it be the difficult circumstances, whether it be, as Nathan prayed for us, the addictions that sometimes come into people's lives, these are all the effects of sin, and Jesus comes to reverse that, to correct that, to be the solution for all of those things. And as we see Jesus healing the demon-possessed, And healing the sickness, it gives us a glimpse as to what he will do when he again returns a second time. That as he shows his authority in these settings, it is a glimpse of what he will do at the end of time when he comes triumphant again and sin and death will be put away and we will be with him forever. Jesus' earthly ministry was to give that glimpse and was to show us who he is, the Son of God, the powerful one, the one who has authority over every aspect of life. And so I want to move on to my second point this morning with all of those thoughts in mind, is how do you respond to such a ministry? How do you respond to Jesus' ministry? Well, you might say, Mark, we don't have Jesus here. I haven't seen him cast out a demon. 
Jesus is not here. He, he can't touch me and, and heal me. But no, we have these things recorded for us as a testimony to show us that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Have a look with me back at verse 16 of Mark chapter 1 where we see Jesus walking beside the Sea of Galilee and he comes across four gentlemen, doesn't he? Simon and Andrew and James and John. The call is going out there, repent and believe because the kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus comes to these men and he says to them, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we can see the play on words there, can't we? Because these four men, they are fishermen. They are literally there at their boats. They are mending their nets. They are perhaps even preparing for the next fishing expedition so that their family businesses could keep running. And Jesus says to them, come, follow me. Oh, hang on, Jesus. Uh, where are we going to live? Uh, how will we, we be provided for? Uh, uh, what are the conditions of, of, of coming and following you? There is none of that that we see. We see that there is an immediate response that they look at who Jesus is and perhaps they have seen him preaching about the good news of the kingdom of God and when that call is issued to them, they are compelled to go with him. And I wonder whether that's the case in your life. That as you look at God and what he has done and particularly the call that he gives us through Jesus, is there something that wells up within you that's saying, yes, I will follow Jesus. And again, Jesus has in mind not for them just to follow him and to watch him and see what he does. Jesus gives them a purpose and says, I will make you fishers of men. Now, I'm not sure how many of you like fishing. I mean, I don't mind it. Um, particularly when I was living in Queensland, it was good because the weather is warmer. I'm happy to sit there by the banks of the water and cast the rod in. But sometimes fishing can be, oh, it can be a little bit boring for me. The fish aren't biting. Oh, so what do I do? Just give up. But no, what I did was I actually found another style. And even though I wasn't the most successful fisherman, I, I still enjoyed you know, that thrill of catching that fish and reeling it in. Is that what Jesus is talking about here, that we are just to cast our line out and just hope that someone grabs the bait? What Jesus is referring to here is in being fishers of men is that, yes, we carry a life-giving message. And that we are to go and we are to take that message and we are to go to where the fish are, as it were. Yes, some will be interested. There might be days, there might be longer periods of time where the, the fish, as it were, just aren't biting. And we get no response to our message. But God still calls us, be faithful. Carry that message. Take that message of hope and of life to the people around about you. Because it is not up to us to catch the fish, it is us to give the message and for God to do his work within the lives of those around us. Come follow me, Jesus says, and I will make you fishers of men. And in that response of Simon and Andrew and James and John, we see full obedience in four statements, where they are willing to follow Jesus. And so they go, and as Mark's gospel unfolds, they go and they witness Jesus preaching. They go and they witness him doing healings. They themselves actually go out in the power of Jesus' name and see people come into the kingdom of God. The next response I want you to see is that one of amazement. In verse 21 is that uh, the disciples, uh, so that Simon and Andrew, James and John and Jesus, uh, they went to Capernaum where Jesus on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. And Jesus there is given that opportunity to teach. Now remember that Jesus is a Jewish male. Jesus would have grown up going to the synagogue week after week after week. We see him in the beginning of Luke's Gospel where he is interacting there with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and they were amazed at his knowledge of the things of God. And so it's not surprising that Jesus has the opportunity to come and to preach within their midst but what is incredible is the people's response. Verse 22, the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. You see, at that time, the rabbis or the teachers of the law, they, they were just reliant on the opinions of others. You know, they would just get the people together on the, in the synagogues and they would just say, oh, well, 
Rabbi such and such, he has this to say on this particular issue, but if you don't quite follow him, well, you can follow this rabbi over here. And, you know, he, he's probably got a softer approach to that particular matter. But when Jesus comes, he comes teaching in a different way. He comes as a man who has authority. He comes as God himself in their midst, proclaiming the word of God to them. And here within Mark's gospel, Mark is not giving us what the content of Jesus' message is. He is giving us the character of Jesus' message. That he teaches with authority. You can turn back to Matthew's gospel in Matthew chapter 5, where you can read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus often starts off with those words, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And Jesus comes with those words. And he comes proclaiming God's word. And we have God's word written for us. And we have that same authority there before us. And I wonder this morning whether you look at the teaching of Jesus, whether you look at the teaching of God's word, and are you amazed? The danger that we have is that, if, particularly if you've been a Christian for a long time, is that we can become very familiar with God's word. Oh yeah, I've heard that before. Oh yeah, that's right. And it doesn't really make that impact. And so I would encourage you that as you gather each and every Sunday morning, as you hear God's word here on Sundays, or as you read God's word yourself, look at the word of God and again be amazed because it shows us the glorious nature of our God, the wonderful blessings that he gives us within Jesus. And he is the one who teaches us indeed with authority. Well, based on that authority within the synagogue, look at what happens next, as we see there in verse 23. Just then, here Jesus is preaching, he is teaching them with authority, just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. First question I've got, how could a demon-possessed man be a part of their synagogue for so long without hearing the authoritative word of God? How could that man, and, and I think that we need to take from the text, that this man was a regular part of their synagogue gatherings. And there was no authority up until Jesus came. And friends, that should firstly remind us as God's people that whoever preaches and stands in this place preaches the word of God with the authority that God gives us. And I trust this morning that you're not just here to listen to me, my word. You are here to listen to God's word. And that is the responsibility of anybody who stands and who preaches. Not just to give some stories, just to entertain or to tickle your ears and things like that but to come and to give the very word of God. And what we see that as this demon-possessed man stands up, he stands up in defiance against Jesus. He exclaims within the midst of that synagogue gathering, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Can you imagine what is happening at this point in time? That everybody's eyes is turned to that demon-possessed man and they're wondering, what's Jesus going to do? What's going to happen? Is that man going to just overpower our synagogue meeting here this morning? What is actually going to happen? And as I reflected on it, and this is certainly not a challenge to any of you, but I wondered what would happen if somebody walked in and interrupted our meeting? How would we handle that circumstance? And notice that the demon-possessed man knows exactly who Jesus is. Jesus of Nazareth. Have you come to destroy us? He knows his fate when Jesus is there within his midst. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And isn't it interesting that the demon-possessed man knows exactly who Jesus is, whereas as we read on and as we look at the responses of people, I wonder, do they really grasp Jesus? And I would have to say that on the whole, no, they don't. 
Well, in response, what does Jesus do in this circumstance? Again, he shows his authority. That even though this man is defiant, he is there opposing Jesus. And here is within Mark's gospel, this is another indication that we have the kingdom of God coming and the clash of the kingdom of this world. And the two are coming into conflict. And we live in such a time where we have such a clash within our society, don't we? The things of Christianity that are being pushed aside. And even there are times within an Australian context where people are becoming hostile because we openly declare our faith in the Lord Jesus. But what about our brothers and sisters around the world where a number of them are unable to meet this morning because Christianity is outlawed within those lands? Again, that shows the clash of the two kingdoms. Will God's kingdom prevail? Or will the kingdom of this world prevail? Now, I'm not saying that anybody who opposes us or everybody who opposes us is demon-possessed. Please don't take that message away. But again, we do see opposition to the kingdom of God. But what Jesus does is that he stands there in their midst and he looks at this demon-possessed man and what does he reply there? Be quiet, he says. Come out of him. Jesus giving words, only a few short words, And the result is is that the evil spirit shook the man violently. There he is. The evil spirit doesn't want to give up on that man. I'm in this man. I'm possessing him. But at the words of Jesus, that evil spirit is cast out. And the evil spirit comes out of him with a shriek. And there we see that there is forced obedience. We see in the disciples that they willingly follow Jesus. But here, this evil spirit, what does he do at the sight and at the words of Jesus? He has to submit. And there is coming a time when Jesus will return. There is coming a time when every person who has ever lived on this earth will have to come before Jesus, as it were, on his throne, because Jesus is coming to judge. As we read in Philippians chapter 2 and at the end there, we will see that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father at that time when Jesus returns. But this morning, now is your opportunity. Now is your time to say that I will willingly follow Jesus because of who he is and what he has done for us by dying on the cross. The people, they're amazed there in verse 27 that they asked each other, what is this? What have we witnessed this morning? We see this man with this new teaching, he teaches with authority, but he even casts out evil spirits. And they go. And what do we read in verse 28? That news about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. They had been witness to something special that day. And as they look at who Jesus is and as they went and as they reported to people, news spread quickly. And we read that as our passage goes on, don't we? That people were bringing the sick. They were all coming to see Jesus. And I put it to you that they were just wanting to see perhaps the spectacular. Yes, some might have been interested in his authority and in his teaching. But what do we read there in verse 32? Where Mark says, that evening after sunset, and that's an important phrase and we might wonder why is Mark emphasizing this? Well, remember, Jesus is in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And on the Sabbath day, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said that you can do no work whatsoever, and that included works of healing. That evening after sunset, they were making sure that the Sabbath day had finished, that people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon-possessed. They were wanting Jesus to do the same of what they heard about in that synagogue meeting. They were wanting Jesus to heal their relatives. They were wanting Jesus to heal the sick and to perform these miracles. And I put it to you is that they were being very self-serving, that they just wanted things for themselves. Sometimes in our lives, we can become selfish. Just asking God for those things that we want. Yes, it is right to pray for your healing. It is right to pray for your needs. It is right to pray for all of your circumstances of life. But what is the context that you're doing that? 
that so that God would work in your life and be glorified? Because what if God didn't exactly answer your prayer the way that you want? What if God wanted you to learn through that time of testing, through that time of sickness, through that time of struggle, God is still there doing his work. This whole town came to Jesus, but Jesus says, no, let us go somewhere else. I have come to preach. Let us go and let us do this. As you look at these responses that the crowds gave, and the disciples, the demon-possessed man. Where do you see yourself fitting in this morning? Are you amazed again at what God has done for you in Jesus? Are you willing to go from here to exclaim the wonder again that God is my Savior, that God has done these things within my life? Can we join with those who are hurting at this time? And to go and to be a comfort to them. To help them to show the mercy and the love of God in their times of need and in their times of struggle. For those who go into the workplace, are you ready to go into another week where you can again say that, you know what, I went to church on Sunday and I was amazed. Not at the preacher, but at Jesus. And who he is and what he has done for us. Jesus came into the world saying the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. This morning as we go from here, I trust that each one of you can say that, yes, I have repented of my sin and I am believing in my Saviour and I go forward in His name. May we as the people of God do this to proclaim Him to this community around us, to be that light of hope that word of encouragement, that word of God to those so that others too may come into the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that through Jesus we have the forgiveness of sin. Through Jesus we are made right with you and we have the sure hope of spending eternity with you because of Jesus' completed work here on earth. Father, we pray that you would go with us in our day-to-day activities that we would take those times each day to reflect on your goodness and your mercy and that we too would be prepared to share the word of hope that you have given to us so that others too may be able to move from death to life and come to know the realities of Jesus, our Lord and our Saviour. Father, go with us, we pray. Speak into our lives. Help us to see more of the amazing things that you are doing and you have done. And we do pray this for the glory of your name.